Okay, and today looks like he's going to lecture us. Presentation. <laughs> We're looking at Mr. Francis Parkman Jr. Serious guy. <laughs> and of course, all the material is from the collection, as you'll, except for some items, you'll see. So he was born in 1823 to a distinguished family, as Wikipedia calls him. Father was a Unitarian, Unitarian Church minister, got a law degree. His family was uh, keen to him for him to practice law. He abandoned that and decided to, uh, and he chose to write about American history. That was also didn't meet the favor of his family because apparently at that time, if you were a historian, you talked about ancient Greek history and an important history like that and not the history of of uh, the American West. His wife, Catherine, he married her um, in 19, 1850. Uh, so he was 27 years old when he got married. And three children, Grace Francis III, because he's junior. And uh, Francis III died in fairly young, and his wife also died in, in 1858. So they used and uh, what's he's famous for? Of course, he was a traveler. He's a historian, a horticulturalist, and an author. An author is what we all know him as. And of course, some of his writings include the Oregon Trail, sketches of a prairie and Rocky Mountain life. That recounts three weeks of hunting buffalo with the, the Sioux Indians out west. The big contribution to, to history was a set of seven volumes called France and England in North America. Volume two in particular is interesting. It talked about the French Jesuit missionaries in Canada. And volume six dealt exclusively with, in, in Canadian history, the, there's only one historical event that has any significance. It's the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, where the English defeated the French for the control of New France. They all wrote essays opposing the rights of women to vote. In general, the writings were very well received. President Roosevelt dedicated his four-volume history of the frontier, the winning of the West, to Parkman. Another literary critic, Edmund Wilson, said, the clarity, the momentum, and the color of the first volumes of Parkman's narrative are among the most brilliant achievements of the writing of history as an art. So very well respected. Now you may recognize the picture on the right and you will look at that signature. We'll come, we may have to come back to it a little bit. Maybe you'll just trust me. Look at that signature. Look how he does the Fs. We'll see. And all of this is compliments of Wikipedia. Thank you very, very much. So here's the stamp, number 1281, the corner block, corner plate right. block 35. 75 fairly straightforward and here it is on first day cover uh september 16th 1967 as part of the uh, prominent americans series come back to that in a couple minutes because there's some interesting uh, there's a question that i can't understand i can't, haven't got an answer for so here's uh you can buy on on ebay the four plate blocks uh all for this one this is with plate block number 25 29 258 the reason I'm presenting this is here to understand how the printing plates are produced and what they look like. Okay. Oh yeah, there's the four corners, the 29, 58 in the upper left, upper right, lower left, and lower right corners. And here's a full sheet, a full pane, sorry. This is a pane with the uh, plate number and block in the lower left corner. And across the bottom, it looks like there's perforation guides. There's space equally for the perforations, but they're not in line with them, but they probably have some role in helping at the very top there's a series of, of dashed lines which in this case actually we'll see in a minute where those lines actually are here's a, a pane from the top of the printing plate and it has uh, the plate number in the upper right hand corner and it also has the perforation guidelines across the top um, so this is what the actual, the likely appearance of the full printing plate with four by 100 stamps with plate block numbers in each of the four corners. And the, dot, the dashed lines are in the middle of this, on this configuration. And they're probably helped too in, in where the, the, the panes should be cut. 
I didn't see anything in the middle stretch, but there could be something there, just maybe not in the samples that I, the, the panes that I had. There's also the coil. And in coils, I like coil, I like varieties too. And we're talking, this is a, a, a coil with a line pair, which is that solid line between the two, the two stamps. And you generally have to have any anything with a line. You try to have at least a block of pair of two, sometimes a strip of four or a strip of six. And uh, that line, I have no, um, I only have an instinct as to what I think it's for. I think it's for being able in a in a roll, if this line would occur every 10 stamps, it certainly would make it easier when they're doing inventory in the post office at the end of the day, trying to figure out how many of the coil stamps they have. I, I believe that they put those uh, lines in every 20 stamps for the purposes okay. of counting in a roll. As the printing plate is put on the rotary press, where the one plate matches the other is where that line comes from. Usually they print the coils in webs, like you would have off of an adding machine paper. And they whistle the paper from one side of the printing press to the other would depend upon the size of the plate that's on or the press that's being used. Another line pair with uh, Mute. there. And it also has the plate number. Now, here comes the interesting part. Here's the here's the uh, the coil on a first day cover. Well, interestingly, this has been mailed to Canada, and it just happened to be mailed at the time of a Canadian postal strike. So the Canada the letter got to Canada, they quickly put the sticker on it, and it now becomes an RTS cover. But what I cannot understand here is this first day cover. The sheet stamp is number twelve eighty one. Well, the first day of, of September 16th, 1967. The coil is number 1297, but it's eight years later mm -hmm. for the first day of issue. The uh, Pendleton Oregon is because his book was you know, his, one of his key feature of American history was the Oregon Trail. That's why they chose to make that the uh, the location for this uh, the first day of issue, and of course he was born in Boston, so that made it pretty straightforward for the uh, the choice of the sheet stamp. But how it is that the coil stamp and the sheet stamp are eight years apart and only eighteen numbers, seventeen that's, eighteen numbers difference? That's, in, in that's because of what Scott does with their numbering. They they believe in things that they call sets. Okay, so this is the same design, but a coil. Even though it was issued years later, they put it uh, near to the number where the where the stamp first got a a, a number. You'll yeah. find uh, French colonial issues that cover fifty or sixty years, and they're all grouped together. So, well, there is also a Canadian connection. Oh, this is wow. perhaps <laughs> this is in uh, Canada number two uh, from eighteen fifty five, addressed to Mrs. Frances Parkin Parkman in Boston. Now, this could either be his wife or his mother. Uh, it's a wonderful stamp. Uh, just a little nick in the top corner, but it's as nice a cover as you can find for a number two, I think. And it certainly is a gem in the collection. That's in your collection? It is in my collection. So is the next one. It's from 1863. So by this time, his wife has died. So my instinct says that both these covers were addressed to his mother because he's Francis Parkman Jr. His father was obviously Francis Parkman too. Mm. So my instinct says that this was likely Mary, and it wasn't his writing. I don't think looking at the F and the writing, uh, I don't think he, although he would have traveled a lot to Quebec and Montreal to do the history and do the research on his books. I'm certainly he was in uh, Quebec and Montreal in that area quite a time. Maybe his handwriting changed between the, what we see here in, in 50 early in his life and, and later on, he would certainly be interested in writing to his mother or, and, uh, or somebody else maybe doing research for him. But um, it certainly is, it's a number 17 from 1863. So here is the Parkman Memorial uh, in Boston and, and Jamaica Plains at the park. They have a quite a quite a say the American Historical Society also issues their annual uh, Francis Parkman award to the 
book on uh, American history that was published that year to the winner. And so he's very, he's got a school named after him and uh, very popular. I have a theory about the late issue of the three cent coil. Um, I don't, I have nothing to back it up with other than an idea. And that is that they might, maybe there was lots of excess um, three cent Liberty coils from the Liberty series um, left over. And maybe it was something as simple as that. Um, I don't know. You know, maybe but maybe that's as good a guess as any. Before they decided to issue another three cent coil, they they figured they'd get get rid of the all the excess stock that they had. Um, I mean, I actually remember in the eighties. I can't remember exactly when in the eighties. I want to say mid eighties to maybe mid to late eighties. In my post office here on the Upper West Side, I could still get the number. I was just looking it up here because you triggered it in my memory. Arnie, the 25 cent Paul Revere coil from the Liberty series in a postal vending machine where you put the coins in and depending on how many quarters you put in, you press the button and it would, you know, and they would just come out of the roll and then it would stop right at the perforations and you'd just tear it off. Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly they were, and they had multiple printings of that particular stamp. I know there were wet and dries and so forth. But um, that, yeah, that's just my idea on it. It also been that there was some postal need for it suddenly at that point. Mm -hmm. Is it like it was an additional ounce or something like that? Right, right. some rate related issue. Yeah, that's true. 